everybody. Put your hands if you feel free to unmute yourselves and join us and say hello to everybody. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Wow, you guys all really show up right on the dot or like when I turn it down. Right. <laughs> Good thing Alan likes, you know, play. He gives us a little extra time to like. I have. Get. I don't even see the curse. Oh, all right. Well, everybody, welcome to this wonderful, beautiful Sunday morning. Um, our our mornings get more and more exciting as we go, because of course we have added a service to our Sunday mornings. And um, we're, we're continuing to explore how people want to connect to church. So we're glad to have you with us this morning by Zoom. That's still the preferred way for a lot of people. I just have a few announcements for the life of the church. And then we will begin with our centering music for this morning. The first thing I want to mention, of course, is that we are taking a two-week break from our Friday cocktails and conversations, the last two weeks of August. I will also, with Chris, be on either a vacation or a staycation of some type or another. So next week and the week after, Dan Weir will once again be our guest minister. And you will have a guest team, well, not a guest team, our own team, our in-house team facilitating the service. So um, please, please be appreciative of the effort that everyone will be putting into doing that. And this will be different than the last time we did it because we're live this time. So Dan will have some additional challenges along with everyone else. So we'll, we'll do our best and just come and, and be present and know that God is with us through everything that we, we do and do well or do with enthusiasm anyway. Additionally, we have an extra choir rehearsal today at two o'clock for those who are wanting to sing in our statewide choir. Billy has sent out links to all of the materials but in case anybody didn't already hear this announcement, um, Billy is helping put together a statewide choir. And I'm not exactly sure how many people will show up right now, but it looks like we've got over 20 at least. So that'll be that. And I, I imagine it'll accumulate a few more as we go. And meanwhile, as always, I want to thank Alan for his beautiful compositions, both the ones that he's been sharing throughout and all the playing that he does just spontaneously and joyfully, not for one service, but now for two. He does the end of the 915 service and the beginning of this one and throughout this one. We also have special music contributions, again, from Meg's friends, Ken Turley and her friend, Karen. So um, we appreciate the viola and guitar. And those are all the announcements I have for the life of the church. So this is a time for announcements, not prayer requests. So if there's anything that's like an announcement announcement. Oh, by the way, uh, today is going to feature an interview with Meg Phillips about Honduras. So that'll be our spotlight today, just in case you were curious. Any other announcements for the life of the church? If there is anyone that's interested in the statewide choir, Scanning to see if there are there actually two links. Oh, looks good. All right, then I'm going to invite us to center ourselves with today's music. Okay. Can you guys see me or hear me? Chris is saying we're gone frozen. That may be why we hear Jeanette. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can. I was getting a message that I was frozen or gone for a minute there. Yep. All right. Jeanette, 
So and let's go with our centering out. music then. Or not. Maybe somebody else is frozen and it's not me. I wonder. That could be happening. Check uh -oh. to make sure they're unmuted. I can't hear you, Jeanette. You're muted. The code, I can't tell who is playing the music. It's might be, they might be muted. Oh.
I'm just going to do a quick check. Was that sound breaking up for most people? Okay, yeah. All right, so it's, it's breaking up at the source. Not sure why. Um, but it seems to be a universal experience. So that was like multiple little centering segments. Consider yourself centered and welcome to worship in a peaceful or curious manner anyway. Um, this is of course the time in our service when we begin our prayers of the people with those that are raised up in concern. And I have a few requests that have already been given to me this morning, so I'm just going to name those and then ask that you would unmute yourselves and share any that you might want to add. We were asked to pray for the state of Iowa which has been devastated by the fierce winds. I don't even know the proper weather term for the kind of winds they were, but they're hurricane force winds, but they don't go in a circle, they go straight. And they devastated basically the entire crop for the entire state or most of it. They devast it devastated Cedar Rapids. It's caused billions of dollars in economic loss and damage. And they are not actually on the radar screen of a lot of people or a lot of support yet, I don't think. And so we happen to have people that are connected out there and asked us to pay attention and simply hold them in our prayers at least. We have a request for prayers for people that are having a new experience with cancer, Tina and uh, the daughter of one of our families who has some new news and is asking us to hold her in prayer. And we, of course, continue to pray for those who are actively on treatment. We think of Cheryl, Gloria, Claire, and so many others who are quietly undergoing forms of treatment, but wish to have privacy during this experience. We think about the Barnes family that had a very devastating fire just yesterday and lost property, although not life. We have a, a dear friend, Gay, who is on hospice and Sandy, would you tell us your dad's first name? Yes, Robert. Robert, we ha want prayers for Sandy's father, Robert. Thank you. You can say more if you want. Um, he's been dealing with dementia for several years, but. Do you want me to say? Last week he Broke, so he's in the in the hospital and we don't know what's going to happen and the family can't go in to see him so we know that there's already a lot of heavy hearts here and if you have something that you want to share this is a place where you can do so and you will be held up in prayer Alan has a prayer request. Yes, I'd like to pray for all those healthcare workers that are um, uh, working on the vaccine for COVID. Uh, last I heard, uh, they're in phase three. And I pray for those people that are going to be in that um, trial, as well as all the healthcare workers that are working on that vaccine. Alan asked for prayers for healthcare workers and researchers who are working on the vaccine. We also have a request for a prayer for teachers and students and parents as schools reopen and people navigate what this will mean for them going forward.
Are there other prayers that I don't see here? Um, feel free to unmute yourselves if I'm missing you. Uh, Sue, go ahead. Yes, I just want to mention my friend Roland, and please continue to keep him in your prayers as well as his family. Thank you. We'd like to ask for continued prayers for our daughter, Kristen. She had successful surgery to remove a cyst on her neck this week, and uh, it was fortunately found to be benign, which is great news, and she'll be continuing her chemotherapy beginning uh, Tuesday. We continue to pray for Kristen and for Roland and for all those that have been undergoing, again, you know, treatment for cancer, for other forms of surgery, for life altering and healing treatments and sometimes simply for things that are changing us. We think also obviously of Barry and Jan and their ongoing journey. And yesterday I got to visit with Richard Augustine and Joyce. And so we lift them up in prayer and give thanks for the great strides that Richard has made in his recovery from stroke. And we think also of Paulette, another family member. Okay, is there anybody else that's raising a hand that I'm missing? I don't mean to leave anyone out here. Unmute yourself if I've missed you. All right, I think we're good. So I'm going to move us into celebrations because we could use a little bit of light and some joy today. And I think there are a couple people that are going to be responsible for giving us some happy news because I'm fairly sure that Tom and Cheryl have an anniversary. And Jim and Claire also have an anniversary and we have some upcoming birthdays. So I think we should do like a mutual happy birthday, happy anniversary sing because at least on Zoom we can sing to each other. So I think in the middle of a prayer, a good song might make us feel a little bit cheerful. So how about a happy anniversary birthday song? Off key if you can possibly do it. So why don't you unmute yourselves so we can do this the best, most messy way possible. <laughs> Happy birthday and anniversary to Happy anniversary birthday to you. Happy birthday anniversary to you. Happy birthday anniversary to you. Happy birthday Oh my goodness. Um, let's see, we also want to just appreciate that Wendy and Scott, whose wedding I officiated yesterday, got married and we're happy for them. And our, one of our congregation members, Donna, her son, Tim and Michelle got married just last weekend. So she's back from that and very happy for that. Is there any other happy news that anybody wants to share with me that I have overlooked in any way? Please unmute yourselves and just shout out. Don't wait for me to notice you. I, it's Janice, and I'd like to, uh, first I'd like to thank everyone for your continued prayers and support um, as we, uh, as Barry and I uh, go on this journey. But we actually, from our condo in Plymouth, were able to see the Mayflower sail home. Oh, at the end of its journey, it came back. It was the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Plymouth, which has been kind of a fizzle because of the pandemic. There were lots and lots of things planned, uh, but they haven't been held. But this did, the Mayflower is actually in Mystic, Connecticut, being refitted for three years. So it sailed back home uh, for the first time. Uh, and there was a huge flotilla of small boats that escorted it. And it was quite impressive to see it come around the point where we live under full sail. It was so that, that was exciting. So the, May, the Mayflower too is back. If anyone oh. wants to see it when the pandemic is over. <laughs> That's cool. 
Thank you for that visual. It's fun to just think about, you know, a piece of history sailing around and like reminding us about all the positive and challenging parts of our histories. There's lots of stuff in there. Um, any other joyful, happy news? We're spending a whole long time on our happiness, I hope, today. Arden, are you talking to us? Because I can't hear you if so. You unmute yourself. There, there we go. go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Allison has been here for seven days. She will has a couple more. But I just want to say that she's um, really, oh, she looks wonderful. She acts wonderful. Um, she, the one remaining thing is her hearing is very compromised. But she's going back to a specialist in New York City on Friday. And they're going to see what they can do about that. But we've had a really, really wonderful family time together. Yay, we are happy for great news about Allison. And I'm so glad that you got to have family time with her, Arden and Ray. That what, what a special gift for this summer. Wow. Alan? Yeah. So I haven't seen her since Christmas and with the intervening everything, it's, it's just so good to see her. And her hair, her long, long hair she had oh, forever. I've never hair. seen her as short ever. <laughs> as she has out in Geneva there, and it looked adorable. It makes it kind of look adorable. So she looks good too. Yay. Um, Alan has a piece of happiness, I think, for us. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Close to my house, and the family moved in, and they're very excited. So I uh, have a new addition to Amherst with their uh, three year old daughter. So Alan is starting a new chapter. I'm translating because he's here with me and you guys may, not, may or may not hear him. Uh, he, he's closed on his new house or his old house, old house. Old house. So there's a new family moving in there and he's starting a new chapter of his life in a new location. But happily, he's still going to continue to be here. So don't get worried about that. That's, that's a good piece of news, but not bad for us. All just good. <laughs> um, and I think there's a few other people that are in the midst of relocating and some of those are happy stories. So we'll, we'll pray for those that are relocating, changing residences. And I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer now, please. Holy God, you are the God of Paul and Silas and Lydia. You are the God of creativity, of energy and hope and healing. We ask that you will be with those partner communities that we hold always in our prayers, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe, and the communities that we will be talking about, we hope, this morning with Meg in Honduras, and our own valley, and the people who gather here as your children outside, inside, at home, wherever they may be, wherever we all are, we are yours. And this world has been racked by restless, destructive winds this week, winds of, of actual weather, winds and flames that have claimed property, have claimed crops and livelihoods, other kinds of forces that take our lives or change our lives in unwelcome, unexpected ways, through social systems, through illness, through things that are not of our choice or our making. And yet you, you are the presence of the spirit and the wind that holds us, that when we are buffeted, when we are challenged, or laid down by these things, you are the one that lifts us gently up, that comes to us as the hands that love us, the healing that lights up our bodies, that changes us and brings us back to ourselves. 
Today, when we hear the story of Lydia and other women and the way that they work to become resilient and have independence and strength, when we think of the men who are in our lives, when we think of all the people of any kind of affinity or identity who are your children, we ask that you will be the one who fills us up with the spirit and wraps us in your own presence, your own light and your own breath. That the forces which would seek to hurt us and harm us and divide us will not have their way. That you will be the one that helps us withstand all and remain standing as your children. We offer you now our silence. So friends, we're not sure, I'm not sure if we actually have an active connection with our co-facilitator. Yes, he's back. So here we go. We are going to say our prayer together and you get the words on your screen. Feel free to unmute yourselves and say this prayer together. Our Father, Father who, art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, thy name. be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will, thy will be done, done. on earth, earth as it is as in it heaven. Is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And if I'm correct, the next thing that happens should be that we are going to have the scripture up on the screen. I have to make sure I'm keeping up with where I'm supposed to be in our service. And we will be reading from Acts 16. And it's actually this verses 11 through 15. I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves, please. And here we go. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. The following day to Neapolis, a leading, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me, to be a faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. So ends the reading. So I'm going to give us a little bit of a framework today. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then I'm going to give us some framework, and then we're going to hear our chat with Meg about Honduras. So please pray with me. May the words of my mouth, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. First of all, I want you to notice that in this text, the pronouns have changed from earlier chapters. This is a first person account, we. The narrator is using the pronoun we, so the author has changed and the perspective in this chapter has changed. I also want you to pay attention, if you will, please, to the figure of Lydia. I wonder if you would just raise your hand if you have heard about Lydia. If you're in the Friday group, you may have heard. So go ahead and raise your hand if you know who Lydia is, or if you've at least heard a little bit of her story. So there's a handful of you. 
Often women's groups will know about Lydia. Women like other populations that are not always well represented in the Bible look for themselves in these stories and Lydia is one powerful figure that we can point to and say, ah, here is a woman who sets an example that I would like to follow. She is a woman of faith and she reaches out swayed by the word of Paul who has come to the place where she prays by the water and she asks to be baptized and her household is baptized with her much as we heard that Cornelius the centurion was baptized and along with him his entire household and like the centurion and like the eunuch before him she is a figure who straddles many parts of society. She is rare in the Bible as a woman of privilege and influence. When we say that she's a dealer in the purple cloth, that means that she runs her own business and it's a business that's very exclusive. The purple dyeing of cloth was a guarded industry secret and trade. It was handed down in certain cities. And those goods were only available to certain strata of society. You know, generals, officers, royalty, other people were not allowed or could not afford to wear purple garb. And so she was a wealthy woman. She was in charge of her own household. She could make decisions. She had agency and advocacy at her fingertips. These are not things that you often hear about a woman in the Bible. And along with those traits, we know that later Paul is actually thrown into jail in the very next scene. And after he's released from jail, after arguing with the magistrates and telling them that he was wrongly jailed and he's a Roman citizen and they get worried and they apologize and send him off, he retreats back to Lydia's house. So not only does she become an early founder of the church in Philippi, but she becomes a home base for the leading evangelists of their day. She becomes the safe place where they can go for respite and safety and ongoing work. I want you to think about Lydia and think about the fact that through the centuries, textiles the use of fabrics or other kinds of textiles and arts like them have often been a source of independence, economic well-being, and a form of identity for women. Seamstresses, hat makers, skilled artisans of all kinds often could make a living, might actually be able to move away from a traditional household or position, or if they held a traditional position in their household, still bring in an income, and it would be a respectable um, role to fill. And that story, as you will hear in our interview with Meg, holds true now. So I ask you to listen to how the practices and the traditions that made Lydia into the figure that she is for Paul in his day and for women in our day who are looking for such role models, how her story intersects with the women that you will meet in the interview with Meg about Honduras. How are they turning that same type of trade into a form of independence and sustainability for themselves and their families. Let's watch and share in the interview with Meg. This is Gail and Meg, and we are talking about Meg's work and volunteer time in Honduras Hope. Meg, let's just dive in. The two communities that Honduras Hope has relationships with are both in the Department of Euro, which is like the state of Euro, and 
One is Plan Grande, which is a native Talapani community outside the city of Yoro. People are not, the, the natives are not liked to be in the city, so they're kind of pushed off to this um, land in Plan Grande where they farm and they have homes. And then the other community is a squatter's community, a four hour hike as I experienced once up in the mountains um, called San Jose. And those are the two communities that Honduras Hope works in consistently. And can you give us an overview of the types of partnerships that Honduras Hope has built with the community? What, what were identified as the needs and how have they responded to those? Honduras Hope works on a community model. Um, they develop relationships with the people in each community. They work with what we call the selectmen, which are the patronato in each of these communities, and the communities decide what their needs are. Honduras Hope works with them to fulfill their dreams towards better housing, education, healthcare, clean water, and all these areas um, Honduras Hope works on on a consistent basis. And they've been doing this since in, in those two communities since 2001. So they have do have a very long-term relationship with that section of Europe. Uh, the founder, Bill Briggs, Reverend Bill Briggs, uh, has been working in Honduras for probably almost 40 years. And he's a local person here in New Hampshire who has developed this relationship. So this is both a local and an international connection that we have. The, the really, for me, the interesting local connection is that um, one of our deacons, Steve Swenson, had a friend who was a minister in Franconia, a retired minister. And he asked him to do pulpit supply for two Sundays in a row in January. And I had just retired that month. And I remember sitting in my pew at church, listening to Bill Briggs talk about his experience in Honduras with Honduras Hope. And I got the spark. The board is made up of people mostly in New England, so it feels like a very local group. And we work with the same board members all the time and the same communities all the time, same people. Um, the first time I went, I got to meet all the players from the patronato in the different communities to the nurse we have, to the boarding house, um, headmistress, et cetera. And the communities are making great strides every time we go. Honduras Hope sends people four times a year. So they maintain a really close relationship with the folks there and have their finger on the pulse of what's happening and support them in their endeavors. People may go four times a year, but there are people on the ground there, I believe, who are constantly monitoring and working on whatever we're supporting down there. Right. Um, the Honduras Hope built and sponsored a nurse for a health clinic up in San Jose in the mountains because they had no health care at all and has been paying for several years for the nurse to operate the clinic who responds to the needs of that village and some outlying villages. Um, in both communities, they've helped to build some of the schools. Uh, Honduras Hope supports a sustainable feeding program for preschoolers, kids too young to go to school, five days a week they pay uh, one of the local women to run a nutrition program so the little children are getting fed at least one good meal every day. Two years ago, they, um, Honduras Hope was able to receive a grant from the UCC's Genesis Fund of over $20,000 to help with communication, uh, more sophisticated communication and um, transparency and through that, we're able to hire a young man named Cesar, and Cesar speaks fairly good English. He works 20 hours a week in both the communities, so he is on the ground all the time when the Honduras Hope board members and volunteers can't be there. Um, for instance, when the pandemic came, Cesar communicated with the board in New England so that they could buy all this food and seed crops for the spring planting. And he also coordinates in the local community um, trucks to take up rice and beans every week to distribute to the families in both of those communities. So we have this ongoing presence, which has made an enormous difference in 
the success of the programs because not just four times a year for 12 days at a time, but every day there is somebody representing Honduras Hope working with the folks. We have an education committee um, in Plan Grande, which is the, the community that's close to Euro. There are several members of the community that work on things like how are we gonna pay for the children's uniforms? They worry about who's gonna get a scholarship for college, who needs a scholarship for the trade schools. And they do all this coordination on their own when the board members aren't there, the visitors aren't there. More of their children are going on to high school. More of them are going on to college and trade schools um, because it's a real cooperative adventure. And Honduras Hope really works on the let's teach them how to fish principle but they are very respectful of local control and very respectful of the local community and what they see as their needs. And so working together, things have made great progress. What do you think has contributed to the conditions that require this kind of partnership for the communities in Honduras? Well, just in general, Honduras is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, even now, uh, six out of 10 households, rural households live in poverty making an average of about $2.50 a day. There is very little support from the city and the state in terms of there's some for education, but really clean water, roads, those kinds of infrastructure items that we always live by are not terribly available. Education for these communities has been very hard to come by. If you live, for instance, up in San Jose, teachers have to come from two to four hours, even by motorcycle, to get up there. And if you walk up there, it's four hours. So these people are really isolated. They're um, folks who have been kind of kicked off of other land and other land and other land. Therefore, they're at the top of the mountains in quite isolated kind of a place. Honduras hope to answer some of those kinds of things, built the health clinic, pays for the medicines, and pays for the nurse to support people's good health. So doing things like that to try to bring basic health care and um, a sustainable way of life to these folks. The Honduras Hope built a real boarding house down in the city of Euro. So the high school age students who live way up in the mountains in San Jose, who could never commute to any kind of a school, they live in the boarding house during the school year. Honduras Hope provides a house mother, a business manager, the food, the furniture, um, in the last two years, they have supplied a part-time tutor to do computer education for the kids, to also work with them on learning how to live with other teenagers, learning how to live in sort of the big city, which to us looks like a tiny town, but living off the farm down in the, down in the big city. Um, so they have a whole boarding house. So all these kids can come down and live for four years or more in the city and actually go to the high school. The educational opportunities have been tremendous, you know. Um, Honduras Hope started two years ago a beauty school in one of the trade schools there. Paid for all the equipment, funded the teacher until it became self-sustaining. Mm. Um, they've also sent students on to university, I know that, and some of them are going to be teachers out of university. One student's just graduated from medical school. Um, I think she's probably in her residency now, and she's a, a shining star of the Honduras Hope program oh, wow. because they've supported her all through medical school. And now she's actually working um, in one of the hospitals in Honduras. Wow. And we've had people who've, um, who have been supported by Honduras Hope to go to nursing school, for instance. And they then can get jobs in local hospitals. And one of them has come back to Honduras Hope and for a while was the nurse in the community of Plan Grande. So what have you done when you go there? Well, since I don't have a great handle on, on the Spanish language, I have been a little bit limited by that. I went to lots of meetings and got the lay of the land and met all the folks from the different communities. I worked with the Girls Empowerment Program, um, which has classes for girls probably from ages 12 to 14, which in Honduras is a very vulnerable age where girls either stop going to school, decide it's time to stay home and have babies, or if you can get them over that hump, they tend to go on to high school and maybe further their life someplace outside of, um, of their little village. We um, visited the Children's Nutrition Center, which is actually a nonprofit that takes in babies and little children whose parents cannot keep them safe and healthy. Um, children who are malnourished, 
sometimes social workers or nurses find these children and they literally ask the parents to send them to this little nutrition center for two months, three months, four months, five months, where they're um, fed and cared for, hopefully to go back home and have a better life. We send the high school girls from uh, the Girls Empowerment Program go once a month to play with the children, to teach them skills, to they make uh, blankets for them, they play games with them, uh, things like that. And this last time, we had a program with the, uh, we actually videotaped girls from the empowerment program showing the kids how to make nutritious shakes out of this moringa plant, which is terribly nutritious. And it's now developed over the last few months that they have a great big garden that is working to grow healthy vegetables for the children in the nutrition center. Oh, wow. Now, how have the members of our community been connected by you with Honduras Hope? In what ways does our church become a partner? Working on our plant sales, giving me money to take, buying baskets, which is you know has been fabulous. Um, um, our church's money went to buy a whole electric sewing machine. The, the women's sewing cooperative was just beginning, and one of the decisions that was made on that first trip was that the women in the sewing co-op co -op would produce the girls' uniform skirts. Everyone who goes to school um, from junior high up actually has to have a uniform. And the women in the women's co-op were good enough seamstresses that they could produce 25 skirts. The cost to Honduras Hope was no more than buying one in the department store, but this way the women in the community had money that they could earn by making these uniforms. So they had just gotten some solar power in the community center, courtesy of Honduras Hope. So instead of the treadle sewing machine they used to use, we bought them an electric sewing machine. And the sewing machine came back into use this spring during the pandemic when the women's basket co-op ended up making thousands of masks. Our church has supported Honduras Hope with um, used laptops. The mission committee has given me money this last time to go to the store and purchase 19 sets of sheets for the boarding house that was desperate, um, foam mattresses for the boarding house which really needed it. This time I helped to buy brand new cookware because they were down to two frying pans and not much else and no silverware in the boarding house. Plant sale that we had this spring supported people um, who were food insecure and Honduras Hope was one of the beneficiaries, big beneficiaries of the earnings from that sale. The second trip I was on, we took a long ride over the mountains. She hired women from the first community to come to Plan Grande and teach women in Plan Grande how to make the baskets. And that little project has grown to be a project where 100, 150 baskets get bought each time a trip goes to Honduras and the women are literally paid for their work has helped them to expand their horizons to sell things in tourist areas like Copan, bring baskets back to the States to be sold in many places. And our church has been a great supporter of buying baskets to help support Honduras Hope. For me, a really interesting story was that Honduras Hope relied a lot on a lovely lady named Rosa that it had helped support through nursing school. She became the um, community nurse about two years ago in Fon Grande. And she also was a the really talented seamstress who really was the head of the women's basket co-op, um, was organized and talented and all that sort of thing. Well, she suddenly decided she needed to go to Spain. And then the big concern was, okay, who is a strong enough leader? Who is going to, who is developed in terms of leadership skills and organizational skills to take this over? Well, it turned out that she has a, a daughter named Rosie Bell. <laughs> Rosie Bell is a sweetheart. We thought, okay, Rosie Bell is going to try to organize the women's call. So this January when I went there, Rosie Bell had a dozen women making baskets. And each woman is paid by the quality and the size of the basket. They are so well organized now. There's a secretary. There's a treasurer. There's a president of this co-op. These women have taken over the whole program. It's just fantastic to see in a couple of years what kind of progress they made as business women, as strong women, as examples for their daughters, a lot of whom are teenagers in the empowerment program. They see that their moms are out there making a name for themselves and earning money. Mm -hmm. um, most of these women really didn't have any kind of jobs. They were just at home 
maybe working a little bit on the farm, but this gives them such power. It's, it's been tremendous to see. So what have you learned from this? I've, I guess my first trip there, you know, you're going to a place where people are very, very poor. It's a little bit standoffish in terms of this is not up to your standards in America kind of a thing. But the more I got to know people, boy, it is such a lesson in we're all the same. And we all have the same hopes and dreams for our children and ourselves. And even if we don't share the same language, enjoying each other's company that you have. It's, it's really, for me, it's been a tremendous learning experience. Um, it isn't the haves and the have nots. Everybody's all in this together. And a very small group of people doing particular things and working with folks can accomplish huge, huge things in a very short time. What is it? You know, we can do small things with great love. And that's what I feel like. Each person is doing small things with great love. And it really spreads and makes such a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of, of people there. Um, I had a, a great experience in one of the houses where they were mixing the cement to do the floors for the house. And the woman of the house, the mother, who had two little children, was making tortillas um, on her stove. And we've got great pictures of the kinds of stoves they have to use. So she was working making tortillas. And I asked her if I could take photos while she did it. And she was very gracious and let me do that. And then that was sort of done. And I always have my knitting with me. So I was sitting outside waiting for the men to be done. And I was working on my knitting. And she had done doing her, making her um, food. And she came out, put a chair next to me, and she brought out the basket she was making for the women's mm -hmm. co-op. And I felt like, gosh, this is just like our groups of, of crafters at home. She and I just sat. We didn't have the same language, but she was working on baskets, and I was doing my knitting, and the men were working on the floors. And it just felt like it was such a companionable time together, you know? Another story from this last trip. And it was I said, I love the baskets. I love selling the baskets. I'd like to be part of all that. So I asked Rosie Bell if we could have a time when the women would show me how to make the pine needle baskets. At least eight or 10 women and some of their little children got together in the community center and they literally showed me how to make the baskets. Wow. And you said it's a, it's a craft that is authentic to Honduras. As artists, what do you see happening for them with the basket? When you go to the airports, you see these kinds of baskets being sold in the airport. Of course, not as nice as the ones that women in Plan Grande are making because they're just vibrant. Um, but it definitely is a Honduran craft, which was lost to this village. But the pine needles themselves are on the pine trees all around the community. They're these big, big, long pine needles. And they're all available right there outside your door. And women will pick the pine needles in bunches and lay them along the roofs. You can see them on the roofs in the village and they have to dry them for a certain number of days and then they weave them into the baskets and then, um, and then use these colorful threads to, so the, to hold the baskets together. You can tell different crafters are coming up with their own designs to how they put things together. Some make things that look like flowers and you know everybody who's a crafter really loves to improve in what you do. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about your faith or the faith of the people that you are working with, either the other volunteers or the people in the communities where you are partnering? What I've learned about faith in general is that there is a, a huge piece of hope everywhere. But you know, if you live in that kind of a, a part of the world, when you're very poor, I think it sustains your faith to have people come and work with you. When they, and so as I say, my feeling of faith is sort of, um, I see that we're, we're all God's children for sure. And that everybody has been a different place in the world or maybe a lot in life. And yet people find joy and fulfillment and satisfaction and love and friendship wherever they are. And I'm not gonna say they're happy like, you know, the poor, the poor people are happy. No, it's not that kind of a thing at all. But, um, but there is fulfillment and joy and happiness and friendship, cooperation, no matter where you are in life. And I, it's a combination of things. People being self-sustaining, but also definitely relying on the help, the physical, the monetary help of this group. I mean, there are things that are literally 
concrete examples of what our Christian love is about. Go someplace, um, meet people where they are, get to know them as people is so enriching to you as a person. You know, once you know people, I think it's that personal connection that makes you do the go the extra mile. And people that you know and care about. And people that I know and care about. Not that you wouldn't give it to people you didn't know, but it gives you that reality check. It's just, it's just made my life so much better. I think I have a much broader and better perspective on how people live in this world. We can learn from everyone else. We can help one another. You don't have to have money to want to be giving of yourself. And there are so many people in this communities that I've found who are very generous with what they have to give of themselves. It's really faith in action. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us that uh, we all belong to each other and that this world is smaller and more closely knit than we even think it is and that what we do can change someone else's life but in in that reaching out what we're doing is opening ourselves up to be changed by love which it sounds like has been part of your journey yeah Meg, thank you for sharing that with us. I hope that the connection stayed stable so most of you got the gist of what we were sharing. Um, so if you wanna unmute and at least give her like a, a big thank you for having that conversation and sharing all those images and thank all you. the work she's done. Thank, in that. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Wonderful. Good night. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, like during the coffee hour, if you have questions for Meg, I'm sure she's available for consultation. <laughs> um, and know that we had a long conversation, so that's an edited version. I hope I did justice to what you, what you said, Meg. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Now would be the time in our service where I simply remind you that just as we have supported Honduras Hope and supported our partners in Zimbabwe, we are hope in other parts of the world and right here in the Valley. And your ongoing and faithful pledges and donations make that possible. And we remain a resilient, shining light. We're versatile, we adapt, we keep going. Um, and so we appreciate your ongoing commitment to this church. You can always make an online dona donation through jxncc.org or drop off or mail in your offering as you choose. I would like to move us now to a, f I was going to do a congregational song. I don't know. Do you guys want to hang in for a song or do you want to go straight to the benediction? Do you want to sing? Are you like a thumbs up or a, I, I'm getting like a mixed signal here. Hmm, I can't tell if we have enough. Is it a majority up or down on the singing? Oh, I guess I'm seeing majority on singing. Okay, we're going to go for it. <laughs> Sorry if you weren't voting for that. <laughs> but you can stay muted for this.
in case you were wondering why we did that, it was because Lydia, of course, was baptized in the water and her baptismal site in Philippi remains a very famous baptismal site. And what a great song to remind us of going down to the water and praying. And we're going to do the benediction now. I think we're going to do it with the words sung still so that you guys can sing along. So um, you can stay muted. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> going to enjoy a brief transitional postlude by Alan, followed by chat, and then more postlude. unmute yourself so we can hear you and then you can um uh, you know chat up each other and meg <laughs> oh, sorry. 